Some women, I grant, would not appear to advantage seated on a pillion, and attired in a drab joseph and a drab beaver bonnet, with a crown resembling a small stew-pan. For a garment suggesting a coachman's greatcoat, cut out under an exiguity of cloth that would only allow of miniature capes, is not well adapted to conceal deficiencies of contour, nor is drab a colour that will throw sallow cheeks into lively contrast. It was all the greater triumph to Miss Nancy Lammeter's beauty that she looked thoroughly bewitching in that costume, as, seated on the pillion behind her tall, erect father, she held one arm round him and looked down with open-eyed anxiety at the treacherous snow-covered pools and puddles, which sent up formidable splashings of mud under the stamp of Dobbin's foot. The painter would, perhaps, have preferred her in those moments when she was free from self-consciousness. But certainly the bloom on her cheeks was at its highest point of contrast with the surrounding drab when she arrived at the door of the red house, and saw Mr. Godfrey Cass ready to lift her from the pillion. She wished her sister Priscilla had come up at the same time behind the servant, for then she would have contrived that Mr. Godfrey should have lifted off Priscilla first, and in the meantime she would have persuaded her father to go round to the horse-block instead of alighting at the doorsteps. It was very painful when you had made it quite clear to a young man that you were determined not to marry him, however much he might wish it, that he would still continue to pay you marked attentions. Besides, why didn't he always show the same attentions, if he meant them sincerely, instead of being so strange as Mr. Godfrey Cass was, sometimes behaving as if he didn't want to speak to her, and taking no notice of her for weeks and weeks? and then, all on a sudden, almost making love again. Moreover, it was quite plain he had no real love for her, else he would not let people have that to say of him which they did say. Did he suppose that Miss Nancy Lammeter was to be won by any man, squire or no squire, who led a bad life? That was not what she had been used to see in her own father, who was the soberest and best man in that countryside only a little hot and hasty now and then, if things were not done to the minute. All these thoughts rushed through Nancy's mind in their habitual succession in the moments between her first sight of Mr. Godfrey Cass standing at the door and her own arrival there. Happily the squire came out too and gave a loud greeting to her father, so that somehow under cover of this noise she seemed to find concealment for her confusion and neglect of any suitably formal behaviour, while she was being lifted from the pillion by strong arms which seemed to find her ridiculously small and light. And there was the best reason for hastening into the house at once, since the snow was beginning to fall again, threatening an unpleasant journey for such guests as were still on the road. These were a small minority, for already the afternoon was beginning to decline and there would not be too much time for the ladies who came from a distance to attire themselves in readiness for the early tea which was to inspirit them for the dance. There was a buzz of voices through the house as Miss Nancy entered, mingled with the scrape of a fiddle preluding in the kitchen. But the Lammeters were guests whose arrival had evidently been thought of so much that it had been watched for from the windows. For Mrs. Kimball, who did the honours of the Red House on these great occasions, came forward to meet Miss Nancy in the hall, and conduct her upstairs. Mrs. Kimball was the squire's sister, as well as the doctor's wife, a double dignity with which her diameter was in direct proportion, so that a journey upstairs being rather fatiguing to her, she did not oppose Miss Nancy's request to be allowed to find her way alone to the blue room, where the Miss Lammeter's bandboxes had been deposited on their arrival in the morning. There was hardly a bedroom in the house where feminine compliments were not passing, and feminine toilettes going forward, in various stages, in space made scanty by extra beds spread upon the floor, and Miss Nancy, as she entered the blue room, had to make her little formal curtsy to a group of six. On the one hand there were ladies no less important than the two Miss Guns, the wine-merchant's daughters from Litherley, dressed in the height of fashion with the tightest skirts and the shortest waists, and gazed at by Miss Ladbrook of the old pastures, with a shyness not unsustained by inward criticism. 
Partly, Miss Ladbrook felt that her own skirt must be regarded as unduly lax by the Miss Gunns, and partly that it was a pity the Miss Gunns did not show that judgment which she herself would show if she were in their place, by stopping a little on this side of the fashion. On the other hand, Mrs. Ladbrook was standing in skull-cap and front, with her turban in her hand, curtsying and smiling blandly and saying, "'After you, ma'am.' to another lady in similar circumstances, who had politely offered the precedence at the looking-glass. But Miss Nancy had no sooner made her curtsy than an elderly lady came forward, whose full white muslin kerchief and mob-cap round her curls of smooth grey hair were in daring contrast with the puffed yellow satins and top-knotted caps of her neighbours. She approached Miss Nancy with much primness, and said with a slow treble suavity, "'Niece, I hope I see you well in health.' Miss Nancy kissed her aunt's cheeks dutifully, and answered with the same sort of amiable primness. "'Quite well, I thank you, aunt, and I hope I see you the same.' "'Thank you, niece. I keep my health for the present. And how is my brother-in-law?' These dutiful questions and answers were continued until it was ascertained in detail that the Lamberters were all as well as usual, and the Osgoods likewise. Also that niece Priscilla must certainly arrive shortly, and that travelling on pillions in snowy weather was unpleasant, though a Joseph was a great protection. Then Nancy was formally introduced to her aunt's visitors, the Miss Gunns, as being the daughters of a mother known to their mother, though now for the first time induced to make a journey into these parts. And these ladies were so taken by surprise at finding such a lovely face and figure in an out-of-the-way country place, that they began to feel some curiosity about the dress she would put on when she took off her Joseph. Miss Nancy, whose thoughts were always conducted with a propriety and moderation conspicuous in her manners, remarked to herself that the Miss Gunns were rather hard-featured than otherwise and that such very low dresses as they wore might have been attributed to their vanity if their shoulders had been pretty, but that, being as they were, it was not reasonable to suppose that they showed their necks from a love of display, but rather from some obligation not inconsistent with sense and modesty. She felt convinced as she opened her box that this must be her Aunt Osgood's opinion, for Miss Nancy's mind resembled her aunt's to a degree that everybody said was surprising considering the kinship was on Mr. Osgood's side, and though you might not have supposed it from the formality of their greeting, there was a devoted attachment and mutual admiration between aunt and niece. Even Miss Nancy's refusal of her cousin Gilbert Osgood, on the ground solely that he was her cousin, though it had grieved her aunt greatly, had not in the least cooled the preference which had determined her to leave Nancy several of her hereditary ornaments let Gilbert's future wife be whom she might. Three of the ladies quickly retired, but the Miss Gunns were quite content that Mrs. Osgood's inclination to remain with her niece gave them also a reason for staying to see the rustic beauty's toilette. And it really was a pleasure, from the first opening of the band-box where everything smelt of lavender and rose-leaves, to the clasping of the small coral necklace that fitted closely round her little white neck. Everything belonging to Miss Nancy was of delicate purity and nattiness. Not a crease was where it had no business to be. Not a bit of her linen professed whiteness without fulfilling its profession. The very pins on her pincushion were stuck in after a pattern, from which she was careful to allow no aberration. And as for her own person, it gave the same idea of perfect unvarying neatness as the body of a little bird. It is true that her light brown hair was cropped behind like a boy's, and was dressed in front in a number of flat rings that lay quite away from her face, but there was no sort of coiffure that could make Miss Nancy's cheek and neck look otherwise than pretty. And when at last she stood complete in her silvery twilled silk, her lace tucker, her coral necklace, and her coral ear-drops, the Miss Gunns could see nothing to criticise except her hands which bore the traces of butter-making, cheese-crushing, and even still coarser work. But Miss Nancy was not ashamed of that, for even while she was dressing she narrated to her aunt how she and Priscilla had packed their boxes yesterday, because this morning was baking morning, 
and since they were leaving home it was desirable to make a good supply of meat pies for the kitchen and as she concluded this judicious remark she turned to the miss guns that she might not commit the rudeness of not including them in the conversation the miss guns smiled stiffly and thought what a pity it was that these rich country people who could afford to buy such good clothes really miss nancy's lace and silk were very costly should be brought up in utter ignorance and vulgarity she actually said mate for meat appen for perhaps and os for horse which to young ladies living in good litherly society who habitually said orse even in domestic privacy and only said appen on the right occasions was necessarily shocking Miss Nancy, indeed, had never been to any school higher than Dame Tedman's. Her acquaintance with profane literature hardly went beyond the rhyme she had worked in her large sampler under the lamb and the shepherdess. And in order to balance an account, she was obliged to effect her subtraction by removing visible metallic shillings and sixpences from a visible metallic total there is hardly a servant-maid in these days who was not better informed than miss nancy yet she had the essential attributes of a lady high veracity delicate honour in her dealings deference to others and refined personal habits and lest these should not suffice to convince grammatical fair ones that her feelings can at all resemble theirs i will add that she was slightly proud and exacting and as constant in her affection towards a baseless opinion as towards an erring lover. The anxiety about sister Priscilla, which had grown rather active by the time the coral necklace was clasped, was happily ended by the entrance of that cheerful-looking lady herself, with a face made blousy by cold and damp. After the first questions and greetings she turned to Nancy and surveyed her from head to foot then wheeled her round to ascertain that the back view was equally faultless. "'What do you think of these gowns, Aunt Osgood?' said Priscilla, while Nancy helped her to unrobe. "'Very handsome indeed, niece,' said Mrs. Osgood, with a slight increase of formality. She always thought niece Priscilla too rough. "'I'm obliged to have the same as Nancy, you know, for all I'm five years older and it makes me look yellow, for she never will have anything without I have mine just like it because she wants us to look like sisters, and I tell her folks will think it's my weakness makes me fancy I shall look pretty in what she looks pretty in, for I am ugly, there's no denying that. I feature my father's family. But, law, I don't mind, do you? Priscilla here turned to the Miss Guns, rattling on in too much preoccupation with the delight of talking, to notice that her candour was not appreciated. The pretty ones do for fly-catchers. They keep the men off us. I've no opinion of the men, Miss Gunn. I don't know what you have. And as for fretting and stewing about what they'll think of you from morning till night, and making your life uneasy about what they're doing when they're out of sight, as I tell Nancy, it's a folly no woman need be guilty of if she's got a good father and a good home. Let her leave it to them as have got no fortune and can't help themselves. As I say, Mr. Have-Your-Own-Way is the best husband and the only one I'd ever promised to obey. I know it isn't pleasant when you've been used to living in a big way and managing hogsheads and all that, to go and put your nose in by somebody else's fireside, or sit down by yourself to a scrag or a knuckle, but thank God my father's a sober man and likely to live, and if you've got a man by the chimney-corner it doesn't matter if he's childish. The business needn't be broke up. The delicate process of getting her narrow gown over her head without injury to her smooth curls obliged Miss Priscilla to pause in this rapid survey of life, and Mrs. Osgood seized the opportunity of rising and saying, "'Well, niece, you'll follow us. The Miss Guns will like to go down.' "'Sister,' said Nancy, when they were alone, "'you've offended the Miss Guns, I'm sure.' "'What have I done, child?' said Priscilla, in some alarm. "'Why, you asked them if they minded about being ugly. You're so very blunt.' "'No, did I? Well, it popped out. It's a mercy I said no more, for I'm a bad un to live with folks if they don't like the truth. But as for being ugly, look at me, child, in this silver-coloured silk. I told you how it'd be. I look as yellow as a daffodil. Anybody'd say you wanted to make a mockin' of me.' 
no prissy don't say so i prayed and begged of you not to let us have this silk if you liked another better i was willing to have your choice you know i was said nancy in anxious self-vindication nonsense child you know you'd set your heart on this and reason good for you're the colour of cream it'd be fine doings for you to dress yourself to suit my skin what i find fault with is that notion of yours that i must dress just like you but you do as you like with me you always did from when first you begun to walk if you wanted to go the field's length the field's length you'd go and there was no whipping you for you looked as prim and innocent as a daisy all the while prissy said nancy gently as she fastened the coral necklace exactly like her own round priscilla's neck which was very far from being like her own i'm sure i'm willing to give way as far as is right but who shouldn't dress alike if it isn't sisters would you have us go about looking as if we were no kin to one another us that have got no mother and not another sister in the world i'd do what was right if i dressed in a gown dyed with cheese colouring and i'd rather you choose and let me wear what pleases you there you go again you'd come round to the same thing if one talked to you from saturday night till saturday morning it'll be fine fun to see how you'll master your husband and never raise your voice above the singing of the kettle all the while i'd like to see the men mastered don't talk so prissy said nancy blushing you know i don't mean ever to be married oh you never mean a fiddlestick's end said priscilla as she arranged her discarded dress and closed her bandbox who shall i have to work for when father's gone if you are to go and take notions into your head and be an old maid because some folks are no better than they should be i haven't a bit of patience with you sitting over an addled egg for ever as if there was never a freshen in the world one old maid's enough out of two sisters and i shall do credit to a single life for god almighty meant me for it come we can go down now i'm as ready as a mawkin can be there's nothing a-wanting to frighten the crows now i've got my ear-droppers in as the two miss lammeters walked into the large parlour together any one who did not know the character of both might certainly have supposed that the reason why the square-shouldered clumsy high-featured priscilla wore a dress the facsimile of her pretty sisters was either the mistaken vanity of the one or the malicious contrivance of the other in order to set off her own rare beauty but the good-natured self-forgetful cheerfulness and common sense of priscilla would soon have dissipated the one suspicion and the modest calm of nancy's speech and manners told clearly of a mind free from all disavowed devices places of honour had been kept for the miss lammeters near the head of the principal tea-table in the wainscoted parlour now looking fresh and pleasant with handsome branches of holly yew and laurel from the abundant growth of the old garden and nancy felt an inward flutter that no firmness of purpose could prevent when she saw mr godfrey cass advancing to lead her to a seat between himself and mr crackenthorpe while priscilla was called to the opposite side between her father and the squire it certainly did make some difference to nancy that the lover she had given up was the young man of quite the highest consequence in the parish at home in a venerable and unique parlour which was the extremity of grandeur in her experience a parlour where she might one day have been mistress with the consciousness that she was spoken of as madame cass the squire's wife these circumstances exalted her inward drama in her own eyes and deepened the emphasis with which she declared to herself that not the most dazzling rank should induce her to marry a man whose conduct showed him careless of his character but that love once love always was the motto of a true and pure woman and no man should ever have any right over her which would be a call on her to destroy the dried flowers that she treasured and always would treasure for godfrey cass's sake and nancy was capable of keeping her word to herself under very trying conditions nothing but a becoming blush betrayed the moving thoughts that urged themselves upon her as she accepted the seat next to mr crackenthorpe for she was so instinctively neat and adroit in all her actions and her pretty lips met each other with such quiet firmness that it would have been difficult for her to appear agitated it was not the rector's practice to let a charming blush pass without an appropriate compliment 
He was not in the least lofty or aristocratic, but simply a merry-eyed, small-featured, grey-haired man, with his chin propped by an ample, many-creased white neckcloth, which seemed to predominate over every other point in his person, and somehow to impress its peculiar character on his remarks, so that to have considered his amenities apart from his cravat would have been a severe and perhaps dangerous effort of abstraction. "'Ah, Miss Nancy,' he said, turning his head within his cravat and smiling down pleasantly upon her, "'when anybody pretends this has been a severe winter, I shall tell them I saw the roses blooming on New Year's Eve. Eh, Godfrey, what do you say?' Godfrey made no reply and avoided looking at Nancy very markedly, for though these complimentary personalities were held to be an excellent taste in old-fashioned Raveloe society, reverent love has a politeness of its own, which it teaches to men otherwise of small schooling. But the squire was rather impatient at Godfrey showing himself a dull spark in this way. By this advanced hour of the day the squire was always in higher spirits than we have seen him in at the breakfast-table and felt it quite pleasant to fulfil the hereditary duty of being noisily jovial and patronising. The large silver snuff-box was in active service, and was offered without fail to all neighbours from time to time, however often they might have declined the favour. At present the squire had only given an express welcome to the heads of families as they appeared, but always as the evening deepened his hospitality rayed out more widely till he had tapped the youngest guests on the back and shown a peculiar fondness for their presence, in the full belief that they must feel their lives made happy by their belonging to a parish where there was such a hearty man as Squire Cass to invite them and wish them well. Even in this early stage of the jovial mood it was natural that he should wish to supply his son's deficiencies by looking and speaking for him. Ay, ay he began offering his snuff-box to Mr. Lameter, who, for the second time, bowed his head and waved his hand in stiff rejection of the offer. "'Us old fellows may wish ourselves young to-night, when we see the mistletoe bow in the white parlour. It's true most things are going backward in these last thirty years. The country's going down since the old king fell ill. But when I look at Miss Nancy here, I begin to think the lasses keep up their quality.' Ding me if I remember a sample to match her. Not when I was a fine young fellow and thought a deal about my pigtail. Oh, no offence to you, madam, he added, bending to Mrs. Crackenthorpe, who sat by him. I didn't know you when you was as young as Miss Nancy here. Mrs. Crackenthorpe, a small, blinking woman, who fidgeted incessantly with her lace, ribbons, and gold chain, turning her head about and making subdued noises very much like a guinea-pig that twitches its nose and soliloquizes in all company indiscriminately, now blinked and fidgeted towards the squire and said, "'Oh, no, oh, no offence. This emphatic compliment of the squire's to Nancy was felt by others besides Godfrey to have a diplomatic significance, and her father gave a slight additional erectness to his back as he looked across the table at her with complacent gravity. That grave and orderly senior was not going to bait a jot of his dignity by seeming elated at the notion of a match between his family and the squire's. He was gratified by any honour paid to his daughter, but he must see an alteration in several ways before his consent would be vouchsafed. His spare but healthy person and high-featured firm face that looked as if it had never been flushed by excess was in strong contrast not only with the squire's but with the appearance of the Raveloe farmers generally, in accordance with a favourite saying of his own, that breed was stronger than pasture. "'Miss Nancy's wonderful like what her mother was, though, isn't she, Kimble? said the stout lady of that name, looking round for her husband. But Dr. Kimble, country apothecaries in old days enjoyed that title without authority of diploma, being a thin and agile man, was flitting about the room with his hands in his pockets, making himself agreeable to his feminine patients with medical impartiality, and being welcomed everywhere as a doctor by hereditary right, not one of these miserable apothecaries who canvass for practice in strange neighbourhoods, and spend all their income in starving their one horse, but a man of substance, able to keep an extravagant table like the best of his patients. 
time out of mind the Ravello doctor had been a Kimball. Kimball was inherently a doctor's name, and it was difficult to contemplate firmly the melancholy fact that the actual Kimball had no son, so that his practice might one day be handed over to a successor with the incongruous name of Taylor or Johnson. But in that case the wiser people in Raveloe would employ Dr. Blick of Flitton as less unnatural. "'Did you speak to me, my dear?' said the authentic doctor, coming quickly to his wife's side. But as if foreseeing that she would be too much out of breath to repeat her remark, he went on immediately. "'Ah, Miss Priscilla, the sight of you revives the taste of that super-excellent pork pie. I hope the batch isn't near an end.' "'Yes, indeed it is, doctor,' said Priscilla. "'But I'll answer for it the next shall be as good. My pork pies don't turn out well by chance.' "'Not as your doctoring does, they eh, Kimble? "'Because folks forget to take your physic, eh?' said the squire, who regarded physic and doctors, as many loyal churchmen regarded the church and the clergy, tasting a joke against them when he was in health, but impatiently eager for their aid when anything was the matter with him. He tapped his box and looked round with a triumphant laugh. "'Ah, she has a quick wit, my friend Priscilla has,' said the doctor, choosing to attribute the epigram to a lady, rather than allow a brother-in-law that advantage over him. "'She saves a little pepper to sprinkle over her talk. That's the reason why she never puts too much into her pies. There's my wife now. She never has an answer at her tongue's end.' but if I offend her, she's sure to scarify my throat with black pepper the next day, or else give me the colic with watery greens. Oh, that's an awful tit-for-tat. Here the vivacious doctor made a pathetic grimace. "'Did you ever hear the like?' said Mrs. Kimball, laughing above her double chin with much good humour, aside to Mrs. Crackenthorpe, who blinked and nodded and seemed to intend a smile, which, by the correlation of forces, went off in small twitchings and noises. "'I suppose that's the sort of tit-for-tat adopted in your profession, Kimball, if you've a grudge against a patient,' said the rector. "'Never do have a grudge against our patients,' said Mr. Kimball, "'except when they leave us. And then, you see, we haven't the chance of prescribing for them. Ah, Miss Nancy,' he continued, suddenly skipping to Nancy's side, "'you won't forget your promise. You're to save a dance for me, you know.' "'Come, come, Kimball, don't you be too forward,' said the squire. "'Give the young'uns fair play. "'There's my son Godfrey'll be wanted to have a round with you "'if you'd run off with Miss Nancy. "'He's bespoke her for the first dance, I'll be bound. "'Nay, sir, what do you say?' "'He continued throwing himself backward and looking at Godfrey. "'Haven't you asked Miss Nancy to open the dance with you?' "'Godfrey, sorely uncomfortable under this significant insistence about Nancy,' and afraid to think where it would end by the time his father had set his usual hospitable example of drinking before and after supper, saw no course open but to turn to Nancy and say, with as little awkwardness as possible, well, "'No, I've not asked her yet, but I hope she'll consent, if somebody else hasn't been before me.' "'No, I've not engaged myself,' said Nancy quietly, though blushingly. If Mr. Godfrey founded any hopes on her consenting to dance with him, he would soon be undeceived, but there was no need for her to be uncivil. "'Then I hope you'll have no objections to dance with me,' said Godfrey, beginning to lose the sense that there was anything uncomfortable in this arrangement. "'No, no objections,' said Nancy in a cold tone. "'Ah, well, you are a lucky fellow, Godfrey,' said Uncle Kimball. "'But you're my godson, so I won't stand in your way. "'Else I'm not so very old, eh, my dear?' "'He went on, skipping to his wife's side again. "'You wouldn't mind by having a second after you are gone, "'not if I cried a good deal first. "'Come, come, take a cup of tea and stop your tongue, do,' "'said good-humoured Mrs. Kimball, "'feeling some pride in a husband "'who must be regarded as so clever and amusing "'by the company generally.' if he had only not been irritable at cards. While safe, well-tested personalities were enlivening the tea in this way, the sound of the fiddle approaching within a distance at which it could be heard distinctly, made the young people look at each other with sympathetic impatience for the end of the meal. Oh, "'Why, there's Solomon in the hall,' 
said the squire, and playing my favourite tune. I believe the flaxen-headed ploughboy. He's for giving us a hint as we aren't in enough of a hurry to hear him play. Bob, he called out to his third long-legged son, who was at the other end of the room, open the door and tell Solomon to come in. He shall give us a tune here. Bob obeyed, and Solomon walked in, fiddling as he walked, for he would on no account break off in the middle of a tune. "'Here, Solomon,' said the squire, with loud patronage. "'Round here, my man. Ah, I knew it was a flaxen-headed ploughboy. There's no finer tune.' Solomon Macy, a small, hale old man with an abundant crop of long white hair, reaching nearly to his shoulders, advanced to the indicated spot, bowing reverently while he fiddled, as much as to say that he respected the company, though he respected the keynote more. As soon as he had repeated the tune and lowered his fiddle, he bowed again to the squire and the rector and said, "'I hope I see your honour and your reverence well.' I'm wishing you health and long life and happy new year. I'm wishing the same to you, Mr. Lameter, sir, and to the other gentlemen and madams and the young lasses. As Solomon uttered these last words, he bowed in all directions solicitously, lest he should be wanting in due respect. But thereupon he immediately began to prelude and fell into the tune which he knew would be taken as a special compliment by Mr. Lameter. "'Thank ye, Solomon, thank ye,' said Mr. Lameter, when the fiddle paused again. "'That's over the hills, and far away, that is. My father used to say to me, whenever we heard that tune, "'Ah, lad, I came from over the hills and far away. There's a many tunes I don't make head or tail of, but that speaks to me like a blackbird's whistle. I suppose it's the name. There's a deal in the name of a tune.' But Solomon was already impatient to prelude again, and presently broke with much spirit into Sir Roger de Coverley, at which there was a sound of chairs pushed back and laughing voices. "'Aye, aye, Solomon, we know what that means,' said the squire, rising. "'It's time to begin the dance, eh? Well, lead the way, then, and we'll all follow you.' So Solomon, holding his white head on one side and playing vigorously, marched forward at the head of the gay procession into the white parlour, where the mistletoe bough was hung, and multitudinous tallow candles made rather a brilliant effect, gleaming from among the buried holly boughs, and reflected in the old-fashioned oval mirrors fastened in the panels of the white wainscot. A quaint procession! Old Solomon, in his seedy clothes and long white locks, seemed to be luring that decent company by the magic screams of his fiddle, luring discreet matrons in turban-shaped caps, nay, Mrs. Crackenthorpe herself, the summit of whose perpendicular feather was on a level with the squire's shoulder, luring fair lasses complacently conscious of very short waists and skirts blameless of front folds, luring burly fathers in large variegated waistcoats, and ruddy sons, for the most part shy and sheepish, in short nether garments and very long coat-tails. Already Mr. Macy and a few other privileged villagers, who were allowed to be spectators on these great occasions, were seated on benches placed for them near the door, and great was the admiration and satisfaction in that quarter when the couples had formed themselves for the dance and the squire led off with Mrs. Crackenthorpe, joining hands with the rector and Mrs. Osgood. That was as it should be. That was what everybody had been used to, and the character of Ravelo seemed to be renewed by the ceremony. It was not thought of as an unbecoming levity for the old and middle-aged people to dance a little before sitting down to cards, but rather as part of their social duties. For what were these if not to be merry at appropriate times, interchanging visits and poultry with due frequency, paying each other old established compliments in sound traditional phrases, passing well-tried personal jokes, urging your guests to eat and drink too much out of hospitality, and eating and drinking too much in your neighbour's house to show that you liked your cheer? And the parson naturally set an example in these social duties— for it would not have been possible for the Ravelow mind, without a peculiar revelation, to know that a clergyman should be a pale-faced momentum of solemnities, 
instead of a reasonably faulty man whose exclusive authority to read prayers and preach, to christen, marry, and bury you, necessarily coexisted with the right to sell you the ground to be buried in, and to take tithe in kind, on which last point, of course, there was a little grumbling, but not to the extent of irreligion, not of deeper significance than the grumbling at the rain, which was by no means accompanied with a spirit of impious defiance, but with a desire that the prayer for finer weather might be read forthwith. There was no reason, then, why the rector's dancing should not be received as part of the fitness of things, quite as much as the squire's, or why, on the other hand, Mr. Macy's official respect should restrain him from subjecting the parson's performance to that criticism with which minds of extraordinary acuteness must necessarily contemplate the doings of their fallible fellow-men. "'The squire's pretty springe, considering his weight,' said Mr. Macy. "'And he steps uncommon well. But Mr. Lammeter beats him all for shapes. You see, he holds his head like a soldier, and he isn't so cushiony as most of the oldest gentlefolk. They run to fat in general, and he's got a fine leg. The parson's nimble enough, but he hasn't got much of a leg. It's a bit too thick downward, and his knees might be a bit nearer without damage. But he might do worse, he might do worse. Though he hasn't that grand way of waving his hand as the squire has. Talk of nimbleness, look at Mrs. Osgood, said Ben Winthrop, who was holding his son Aaron between his knees. She trips along with her little steps, so as nobody can see how she goes. It's like as if she had little wheels to her feet. She doesn't look a day older than her last year. She's the finest made woman as is, let the next be where she will. "'I don't heed how the women are made,' said Mr. Macy, with some contempt. "'They wear neither coats nor breeches. You can't make much out of their shapes.' "'Fader,' said Aaron, whose feet were busy beating out the tune, "'how does that big cock's feather stick in Mrs. Crackenthorpe's yet? Is there a little hole for it, like in my shuttlecock?' "'Hush, lad, hush! That's the way the ladies dress themselves, that is,' said the father adding however in an undertone to mr macy it does make her look funny though partly like a short-necked bottle with a long quill in it eh, by jingo there's the young squire leading off now with miss nancy for partners there's a lass for you like a pink and white posy there's nobody to think as anybody could be so pretty i shouldn't wonder if she's madam cass some day after all and nobody more rightfuller for they'd make a fine match you can't find nothing against Master Godfrey's shapes, Macy, I'll bet a penny. Mr. Macy screwed up his mouth, leaned his head further on one side, and twirled his thumbs with a presto movement as his eyes followed Godfrey up the dance. At last he summed up his opinion. Now, pretty well downard, but a bit too round at the shoulder blades. And as for them coats as he gets from the flitting tailor, they're a poor cut to pay double money for. Ah! "'Mr. Macy, you and me are two folks,' said Ben, slightly indignant at this carping. "'When I got a pot of good ale, I like to swallow it and do my inside good, instead of smelling and staring at it to see if I can't find fault with the brewin. I should like you to pick out a finer-limbed young fellow nor Master Godfrey. One as it knock you down easier, or is more pleasanter looks when he's pert and merry. Tch said Mr. Macy, provoked to increased severity. "'He isn't come to his right colour yet. He's partly like a slack-baked pie. Man, I doubt he's got a soft place in his head, else why should he be turned round the finger by that awful dunsey as nobody's seen o' late, and let him kill that fine hunting horse as was a talk o' the country, and one while he's always after Miss Nancy, and then it all went off again, like the smell o' hot porridge, as I may say.' That wasn't my way when I went a courtin. Ah, but perhaps Miss Nancy hung off like, and your lass didn't, said Ben. I should say she didn't, said Mr. Macy significantly. Before I said sniff, I took care to know as she'd say snaff, and pretty quick too. I wasn't a-going to open my mouth like a dog at a fly and snap it too again with nothing to swaller. Well, I think Miss Nancy's a-coming round again said ben for master godfrey doesn't look so downhearted to-night 
and I see he's for taking her away to sit down, now they're at the end of the dance. Oh, that looks like sweethearting, that does. The reason why Godfrey and Nancy had left the dance was not so tender as Ben imagined. In the close press of couples a slight accident had happened to Nancy's dress, which, while it was short enough to show her neat ankle in front, was long enough behind to be caught under the stately stamp of the squire's foot, so as to rend certain stitches at the waist and cause much sisterly agitation in Priscilla's mind, as well as serious concern in Nancy's. One's thoughts may be much occupied with love struggles, but hardly so as to be insensible to a disorder in the general framework of things. Nancy had no sooner completed her duty in the figure they were dancing than she said to Godfrey, with a deep blush, that she must go and sit down till Priscilla could come to her, for the sisters had already exchanged a short whisper and an open-eyed glance full of meaning. No reason less urgent than this could have prevailed on Nancy to give Godfrey this opportunity of sitting apart with her. As for Godfrey, he was feeling so happy and oblivious under the long charm of the country dance with Nancy, that he got rather bold on the strength of her confusion, and was capable of leading her straight away, without leave asked, into the adjoining small parlour where the card-tables were set. "'Oh, no, thank you,' said Nancy coldly as soon as she perceived where he was going. Not in there. I'll wait here till Priscilla's ready to come to me. I'm sorry to bring you out of the dance and make myself troublesome. Why, you'll be more comfortable here by yourself, said the artful Godfrey. I'll leave you here till your sister can come. He spoke in an indifferent tone. That was an agreeable proposition, and just what Nancy desired. Why, then, was she a little hurt that Mr. Godfrey should make it? They entered, and she seated herself on a chair against one of the card-tables, as the stiffest and most unapproachable position she could choose. "'Thank you, sir,' she said immediately. "'I needn't give you any more trouble. I'm sorry you've had such an unlucky partner.' "'That's very ill-natured of you,' said Godfrey, standing by her without any sign of intended departure. "'To be sorry you've danced with me?' "'Oh, no, sir.' I don't mean to say what's ill-natured at all," said Nancy, looking distractingly prim and pretty. When gentlemen have so many pleasures, one dance can matter but very little. You know that isn't true. You know one dance with you matters more to me than all the other pleasures in the world. It was a long, long while since Godfrey had said anything so direct as that, and Nancy was startled. But her instinctive dignity and repugnance to any show of emotion made her sit perfectly still, and only throw a little more decision into her voice as she said, "'No, indeed, Mr. Godfrey, that's not known to me, and I have very good reason for thinking different. But if it's true, I don't wish to hear it. Would you never forgive me, then, Nancy? Never think well of me, let what would happen? Would you never think the present made amends for the past?' Not if I turned a good fellow, and gave up everything you don't like?" Godfrey was half conscious that this sudden opportunity of speaking to Nancy alone had driven him beside himself. But blind feeling had got the mastery of his tongue. Nancy felt much agitated by the possibility Godfrey's words suggested. But this very pressure of emotion that she was in danger of finding too strong for her roused all her power of self-command. "'I should be glad to see a good change in anybody, Mr. Godfrey,' she answered, with the slightest discernible difference of tone. "'But it would be better if no change was wanted.' "'You're very hard-hearted, Nancy,' said Godfrey pettishly. "'You might encourage me to be a better fellow. I'm very miserable, but you've no feeling.' "'I think those have the least feeling that act wrong to begin with,' said Nancy, sending out a flash in spite of herself. Godfrey was delighted with that little flash, and would have liked to go on and make her quarrel with them. Nancy was so exasperatingly quiet and firm, but she was not indifferent to him yet, though. The entrance of Priscilla, bustling forward and saying, "'Dear heart alive, child, let us look at this gown,' cut off Godfrey's hopes of a quarrel. "'I suppose I must go now,' he said to Priscilla. "'It's no matter to me whether you go or stay.' said that frank lady, searching for something in her pocket with a preoccupied brow. "'Do you want me to go?' said Godfrey, looking at Nancy, who was now standing up by Priscilla's order. 
"'As you like,' said Nancy, trying to recover all her former coldness, and looking down carefully at the hem of her gown. "'Then I like to stay,' said Godfrey, with a reckless determination to get as much of this joy as he could to-night, and think nothing of the morrow. End of chapter 11